Acts 1, 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So far in the book of Acts, we've seen Christ ascend to heaven after giving instructions to his apostles. At Pentecost, the promised Holy Spirit descends on the apostles and they declare the gospel so that the people surrounding them each understand despite their language barriers. Further miracles and healings performed through the apostles attest to the message of the gospel. Thousands of people hear of the grace and redemption made possible in Jesus and become followers of Christ. As the book unfolds, the church resiliently shares the gospel and there is unity in the teaching and heart of the followers of Jesus. And now, the continuation of our series through the book of Acts. We've been making our way through Acts, and if you are just joining us, I encourage you to catch up by watching online the sermons. Also, I encourage you to read the book of Acts in your Bible. Excellent uh, book. We're going to pick it up today at Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 26, and it's about encouragement, the power to encourage. Some of you may be very natural in your encouragement, but I, I would suspect that most of us need God's help to be encouragers. Is that true? We're, we kind of set our default oftentimes to being discouraged and being discouragers, and we could really use to be encouragers. So this passage of Scripture really had an impact on my life as I was studying for the sermon this week, just a reminder of the power of encouragement and the power that comes from God to be an encourager. So let's look at this text. Acts 11, starting with verse 19. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, remember Stephen, if you were here, Stephen was martyred, he was killed for his faith, and the persecution caused Christians to scatter. Because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. So when they first went out, they, they, they kept kind of among the Jews, they didn't go out into the Gentiles, those non-Jewish folks. We've seen in, in last week that Peter had been called out to Cornelius and, and God was doing a work among the Gentiles, but here as they went scattered, they hadn't yet moved out of the Jewish uh, community, and we're going to see something happen here. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus in Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenist, this is the Greek speakers, in this, count, in this case Gentiles, to the Hellenist, also preaching the Lord Jesus. Now Cyprus is the area that Barnabas is from. That's, that's where he's a native of. So that's maybe one of the reasons they pick uh, Barnabas to go, as we'll see in a moment. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. How far of journey is that? Well, somebody's on their smartphone, you'll see that that journey is about 300 miles from Jerusalem to Antioch. That's, somebody said like to Spokane, maybe Eugene, Oregon. That's a little bit of a trek. They weren't just jumping in their car, correct? Uh, they're going to... Really, well, that's a distance, right? What do you think you can get, 20, 30 miles a day at that time? That's a journey. So they're going to send Barnabas down there to check it out. Verse 23. When he came and saw the grace of God, what did he see? The grace of God, the unmerited favor, the, the gift of God, its goodness that was undeserved. These folks are getting a second chance. And you know, none of us deserve a second chance, but we're granted one by God's grace. Praise the Lord. So he sees the, the grace of God. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad. He rejoiced in the grace of God. We should rejoice in the grace of God. We should be glad that, that God is working and, and showing favor to folks. And, and we should be uh, happy about that. And he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord and steadfast in purpose. 
For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus. You know how far Tarsus is? Let me double check my number, get it right here. About 87 miles. Now, that's something, isn't it? First he's sent to go 300 miles down to check on Antioch, and now he's going to go another 87 and, and come back. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were for the first time called Christians. I said at the first service, I wasn't planning on sharing this. It just came up this morning when for some reason my five-year-old Silas kept asking my wife, Paige, many of you know, if she was a Jew or a Gentile. I'm not sure why. But here in Antioch, for the first time, are, are, are called Christians, right? We are one in Christ, amen? Well, I'd like to make a, a few observations and points out of this passage. First, the first point we, that I'd like us, us to look at and consider is this. Encouragement was a lifestyle for Barnabas. Encouragement was a lifestyle for Barnabas. And it can be for us. It's just a few places we can see that. Acts chapter 4, verses 34 through 37. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of of encouragement. So his name was Joseph, but he was nicknamed the son of encouragement. Wouldn't it be great to be known as the encourager? Which Joseph are you talking about? I'm the encourager. Boy, I, I would love to walk in the fullness of the Spirit and have it said of me. Well, Kevin, which, which Kevin? Oh, the encourager. Wouldn't, wouldn't you like that for your, for your name? A Levite and a native of Cyprus, there we see he was from Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So it was an encourager with his treasure. The money he had, he used to encourage others. Let's look at Acts 9, 26 and 27. And when he, speaking of Saul, and when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who had spoken to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So again, we see Barnabas as an encourager. Everybody else is afraid of Saul. He said, no, wait, wait, I've seen a change in his life. He's living differently. One more passage. Acts 15, 37 through 39. We'll get there in upcoming weeks, but I want to just read this now. Now Barnabas wanted to take with him John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. You see, again, He's, he's playing the role of encourager. Let, let me take Mark with me. Right? It was a lifestyle for Barnabas. Second observation I want us to make is that the source of Barnabas' encouragement was the Holy Spirit and faith. Acts 11.24, For he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. Where, where do we find the ability to be encouragers? It's the filling of the Holy Spirit. It's having faith in the Lord. What kills encouragement is fear. Is that not true? When we're, when we're insecure and we're fearful, it's really hard to be an encourager. <clears throat> and when, when we're not filled with the Holy Spirit, I'll, I'll speak for myself. When I, live in the fullness, when I don't live in the fullness of the Spirit, 
I tend to live full of myself. How about you, how about you guys? Right? And when we're full of ourselves, then we're not encouragers because we're always comparing ourselves. And, and if people are doing better than us, we can fall into self-pity. And if we're doing better than them, we can deal with conceit. But when, if we want to be an encourager, we're full of the Holy Spirit, and we want to see God glorified. He's the one who gets the glory. Now, I don't know about you, but I have to work. By the power of God's grace and His Spirit, I have to work to set my default every morning on faith, not fear. How about you? Do you deal with worries and fears? Is this thing that's, that's come up in our family with Paige's cancer? I, I, I can be overcome with fear, or we can live in faith. True? Say often times here at the church that I've been saved, I'm being saved, and I will be saved. We've been saved if we've asked Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of our life. And, and he forgives us our sin, praise the Lord. We're being saved. Right? God's still working in us, and we will be saved. Praise the Lord. And, and I think it's really, really important that we get this, that Barnabas was filled with the Holy Spirit, that he had faith. And, and I want to say that this, that our faith is not in our faith. Our faith is in our Lord. Praise the Lord. There's stories that I go to over and over again. And again, last night, some of you were with me last night, weren't you? In this sense, you were laying in your bed and you were starting to worry about stuff. True? Anybody else with me? And you start to worry about it. And then, then, you, then you, you worry, so then you, you pray, and then you worry you're not praying enough. You've heard that thing. So, so you're trying to wrestle with that, and you're, you're praying. And here's the thing that, that I go back to over and over again. A moment in my life that I learned about the power of God to help us when we're struggling with faith. My family was on vacation when we got word that a young couple, friends of ours, the woman had passed away, young lady, in her 20s, leaving three small children behind. And I spent a lot of time with that couple. And I was in the car, driving the hour journey to the hospital, and the tears began to, to flow. And in a moment, that whole car just filled, seemed to fill with a dark cloud of doubt and despair. And I caught myself saying things like, God, are you even there? Why is this happening? What if this is all just make-up stuff? What if it's not real? And then there's kind of those thoughts that come in your mind. I bet you, I bet you John Piper and the big preachers don't, don't have faith uh, <laughs> crises like I'm having this moment in this car, and they kind of become that comparison thing, you know what I mean? And then I remo remembered in a second that my faith wasn't in my faith, my faith was in my Lord. As I, as I prayed out, I, I, be, I believe, help my unbelief, I was reminded of Hebrews that says that Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. Praise the Lord. And I cried out to God and said, I believe, but, but, but help me in my unbelief. I don't understand this. And so often times, questions come without answers. And God turns us from the why to, to, to the who, who holds us, him. And I can't even explain it. But I, but I felt like that car just filled with the presence of God in a powerful way. It's just like, it's just like a, a divine hug. And I was able to get out at the hospital <laughs> and minister to the family. Praise the Lord. But my friends, if we want to be encouragers, in a world that's so torn with pain and heartache, we need faith. And if we're going to have faith, we need the Holy Spirit. And we need to know that Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. Amen? Third thing I want us to notice is Barnabas saw grace and rejoiced. Acts 11, 23. And when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad. 
Why wouldn't have you been glad? Was it? Well, look at the story of Jonah. He wasn't so glad to see the grace of God from the Ninevites, right? Anger, bitterness sometimes. We, we, we're not excited about the grace of God. We, we, we're glad to have it ourselves, but sometimes we're not so glad to have, see it on somebody else. But we should be. Nobody deserves a second chance, but God grants them every day. Praise the Lord. He changes lives. Do we have an eye for grace? Do we have an eye to see where God is working? I have to admit that my natural default is to see where things aren't working. I've told a story, and I believe that repeating stories can be a teacher, right? And I love the story. Losing my earpiece here. I love the story of the guy who went into his kitchen. Some of you heard me tell this story. He goes into his kitchen, and as soon as he flips on the light, it goes out. You've seen that, like the, the pop of the light like that? So in the dark, he tries to go get the ladder, the little stool, and in doing that, he kicks over the dog food. When he kicks over the dog food, he doesn't notice until he's on the top rung of that little stool and goes to stand up just when he's stretched out like this to get the, the lampshade off. He steps down, and there's a kibble or a bit under his foot, just like stepping on that Lego. He panics like that, and just at that moment, the lampshade comes free, and he falls backward, shatters the thing all over the ground, all over the floor, to which his wife hears the commotion, comes in and flips on another light in the kitchen that he didn't think about using. And the author who told that story says this, before we try to fix what's broken, we should look for what's still working. That make sense? You know, for example, we do uh, free biblical counseling. I've been involved in that for, for a long time. It's a, a great um, blessing to me, to me to be able to work with families, implying, applying spiritual truth to everyday problems. Do a lot of marriage counseling over the years. And a lot of times we'll, we'll list the areas that we want to work on in a marriage, and people say, well, we don't need to talk about that because, you know, we're doing really well at that. I said, well, let's talk about that. <laughs> let's talk about where God's working. For example, a couple might say, you know, we used to fight about money all the time, but we don't anymore. Now what we're fighting about is this, so we don't really need to talk about money, but no, let's talk about what you learned in handling money that might be able to help you in handling your time. Does that make sense? We need to have eyes for the grace of God if we're going to be encouragers. We've got to see where God's working in people's lives. Barnabas saw the grace of God, and he was glad about it. Praise the Lord. It says in the end of that verse, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. So here's the next things we see. Barnabas encouraged others to be faithful to Jesus. Barnabas encouraged others to be faithful to Jesus. It's about Jesus. Praise the Lord. Are you um, pointing people to Jesus? We need you to be faithful to Jesus. That's what we need to be saying, folks. That, that's, that's what we're about. We also notice, fifth, Barnabas encouraged others to be steadfast in purpose. Stay the course. Steadfastness is important. It's not just a burst of adrenaline and emotion that keeps us going. We need to be steadfast in purpose through our faith in Christ. Amen? Because guess what? Life is hard, is it not? Challenges are real. The sixth thing I want us to notice from Barnabas is Barnabas encouraged others by bringing people together. So Barnabas went to Tarsus. Like, like I've said, that's not a small journey, right? He's already come 300 miles. Now he's going to go 87 miles, one direction, to go get Saul. Why, why, why is he doing that? But he cares, because he cares. He cares about the people he's, he's working with. 
and he cares about Saul. So he brings people together. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. But, but Antioch was a pretty large city, by the way, at that time, probably about a half a million people. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. So Barnabas encouraged others by bringing people together. What does that mean if you're an encourager? <clears throat> it's really, really important that we keep the glory of God as the most important thing if we're going to encourage. So we need to be networkers. You can say, you know what? I... I I know some folks who can help you out with that. That's kind of their area of, of expertise. Let me bring them over to talk to you. That's how we grow. That's how we encourage. When people think, well, this is my person I'm discipling, so I'm not going to let anybody else talk, talk into their life. I'm just going to... That's not healthy, is it? And one of the things you'll notice about Barnabas... is his humility. See, what gets in the way of being an encourager is a conceit and comparison and insecurities, right? We see in Scripture Barnabas and Paul, and pretty soon we see the names listed Paul and Barnabas. He was all right with people going further than he went. I heard D.A. Carson speak about fathering one time being a good father, and he told a story about a father and a son who used to go on walks. And they would stop on their walk and they'd pick up apples that had fallen off the tree and they'd throw them at the trunk of the tree. And they'd take a count to see who could hit the trunk of the tree the most. They did that for many years until the son hit the trunk of the tree more than the father did. And then the father stopped and never went. Uh, on a walk in that area to play that game anymore. And I remember, because D.A. Carson, every time I've seen D.A. Carson, some of you have heard, heard him speak, he's an author and so forth, some of you have not, it doesn't matter if you know him or not, but every time I've seen him, he, 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 he's a gentle-mannered man. And so when, when, I, when I heard him almost snap about that father and call him a small person, how small. I can't even remember all his words. I said, wow. And I thought that is so true, though. If we really are going to be an encourager, we've got to be all right with people going further than we've gone. True? We can't say, you know what, I, I, just want, I don't want to give you, a, yeah, no, that, you know, if we bring Saul over here, he, he might know more about this than I do, so let, let's not bring him. I, I want to be center stage in your discipleship. I want to be the one, Right? That's what we can do in our egos, but that's not healthy. When we really love people, we want the best people around them, right? I think as a father, it's my primary responsibility to, 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 to look after my kids, but I don't think I should do all the training, trust me, right? Some of you have seen my children. They're pretty good at music. That's not because I taught them. We have to be willing to have people go further than we would go. I mean, I liked it when Josh and Noah, my oldest, were young, and we'd go out and play basketball, and, and they'd say, Daddy, Daddy, dunk it. But you, but you know, with, with Isaiah, he's not, he's not asking me to go dunk it. It's his brothers that are encouraging him. And that's cool, isn't it? So if we're going to be in encouragers we need to be willing to let people go further than we could go and we need to be willing to let other people speak into folks lives we need a church that connects people with people say hey I know somebody I think you'd really get along with you I, I know somebody could help you out with that we should be networkers if we're going to be encouragers make sense This sermon is from Edgewood Baptist Church. You can find more information about us online at ebc-edmonds.org. Thanks for listening.